First, know who you are, right? So not everybody is meant to be in the operating room doing implants. Um, so your surgical skills, your training, your background, I can tell you without a doubt, the fellows that are the furthest advanced are the ones that had surgical training before they come to fellowship. Um, the less of that you've had before fellowship, the further you have to go to be an independent implanter. Um, so know all these things before you decide that you want to do implants. So think about those. There's many varieties of how you do implantation. It can be a neurosurgeon, a pain physician, a spinal or orthopedic surgeon. The leads can be percutaneous, you know, anywhere from one to four leads. Um, it can be paddle. Um, there's a variety of different IPGs you can put in. There's kind of different landmarks for recovery. The first couple of weeks is early recovery. First couple of months is when I tell patients, okay, now your leads are probably less likely to be mobile. And then it's considered to be your infection if there's a deep infection in the first 12 months. So surgical site infection, a deep surgical site infection is up to 12 months. Um, and then also know about the risks. There's you know, infection, bleeding, seroma formation, there's lead migration, lead fra fracture, device malfunction, um, pain at the device or uh, the insertion site, et cetera, et cetera. There's a variety of complications that can happen. Um, I didn't mention spinal cord injury, but definitely can happen. So the goals for the implant are to mimic or approve upon the trial placement. Right? So you need to know where, where it was working. You want to make sure those leads are well anchored, the device is connected, um, and it's implanted in a comfortable position that the patient's going to be able to tolerate for many years. Uh, there's no bleeding or infection. You have a smooth post-op recovery. You minimize the long-term infection risk. Remember, it's 12 months where it's yours. Um, you do it efficiently. It's effective. It works like it's supposed to. And then you lay the groundwork for the patient to have sustained benefit in their life with a chronic pain condition. Pre-op checklist is a good idea. That same committee suggested a preoperative checklist. Let's go through the preoperative checklist here. One, check for evidence of active dermal, dental, or urologic infections. If they have them, treat them, right? Number two, order your analysis before procedure. I will tell you right now, I do not routinely do this. Does anybody else do this routinely? Okay. Number three, address prior history of infection and make a plan for prophylaxis. This is essential. Um, if they've had infection with every other thing that's been done, they will, they're at much increased risk for having infection with you too. Review the MRI imaging, makes sense. Check anticoagulation, makes sense. Um, which is the next one too. Review the psychological evaluation. Well, if you did that for, for the trial, you probably don't need to do it again uh, unless there's something that concerned you in the interim. Um, obtain cardiac clearance in patients at risk for cardiac disease, completely reasonable. Um, review trial films and operative notes in preparation for permanent implant. There are times where I'm not the person who did the trial. I'm putting it in. I definitely want to know everything about that trial before I put it in. Um, and I want to read it carefully and look at the images and analyze them. Um, and, then, and then think about where you're going to put the, where you're gonna, where you're gonna put the, the IPG um, and make sure that there's no, no problems with those locations. Um, and then talk about any patient-specific or technical concerns. Obtain insurance coverage. Please, please do that. Your institution will be unhappy if you don't. Um, and then think about surgical considerations. Uh, assess, assess the health status. Have patient enter the bladder preoperatively. This is really important. I have had the privilege of, I'm ready to make an incision. I look up and there's an empty bag. Like, thank you for giving my patient a liter of fluid before we start, and what is going to, which I know is going to be a difficult case. Not good for their comfort. So <laughs> I tell the, I ask the anesthesia team to really minimize fluids and then give them, a, at the end when we're done, give them a bunch of fluid to help with their, you know, not feel lightheaded afterwards. Um, Make sure that, you know, a couple details, make sure you give antibiotics, you have a driver, and all that kind of stuff. So the rest of the stuff is, should be self-evident. So before entering the OR, this is my version. Make sure you know what you're doing. Decide the IPG. Make everything plan as much as you can. Just This is exactly what I we, was on that checklist, but this is my version of the checklist. Um, and be ready to go. The other thing to think about is post-operative pain. You're now a surgeon. You are cutting tissues. You're damaging nerves. There's a healing process. This is painful. So I don't like giving people buckle loads of opioids, so I really firmly believe in multimodal analgesia. So I think it's important to 
take into account the patient's previous experience. Most of the patients will have neuropathic pain. They will have been exposed to some of these drugs. If they don't have contraindications, think about giving these drugs, which are not going to cause coagulation problems and may uh, decrease your opioid requirements postoperatively. So prior to incision, you want to minimize the infection risk. I had people take a chlorexidine shower the night before and the morning of, and then gave them weight-based antibiotic dosing based upon their um, history of sensitivity to antibiotics and also any colonization with resistant organisms. Um, and then a, a, a position them appropriately and well. If it was a difficult access in the clinic, I use a Wilson frame, um, so it, which provides a curve and lets the abdomen sag. Um, if it's a cervical case, I use a cervical positioning device so their head is comfortable and it's not going to move. I don't want them like saying, yeah, like, <laughs> while I'm doing things, so I want their heads to stay there. Definitely sterile prep and drape. I sometimes use an IOBAN, not always consistently, but sometimes do. Um, double glove. And if you're in a place where you have to think about fluoro, then think about it early, because that happened to us just recently. But we were ready to go, but there's a machine, but no one to run the machine. I make sure that happens. Um, Incision. Where you saw where I placed my needle. You saw that that was the vertebral body below where I went in. So don't make the incision over the entry spot into the epidural space. You've got to be down lower. And then you have to think about where the anchor's going to go. You want the anchors to be in kind of the middle to upper part. You want the actual entry to be the middle upper part of your incision, so you have a place for the anchors down lower. The length of the incision, incision depends on the patient's body habitus and how difficult it's going to be and how many leads you're going to put in. Um, use lots of local anesthetic. Be generous. If they have local anesthetic toxicity, you'll get a case report out of it. It is not going to happen. So be generous. I use it with epi and I use a bupi lido combo. That's what I use. Um, and then make your incision, carry it down to get to that supraspinous, beautiful, nice, firm landing zone. Um, make a nice space, dissect out so you're ready to go. So you're ready to put the anchors in. Think about where you put the anchors before you even touch the patient with the needle. Get all ready. Make sure there's no bleeding at this point. And make sure you know that you've gone down onto midline if that's your plan, because you can put one from each side. Or if, if you can come about two, one or two leads from the right, you know, decide, you need to know where midline is and make sure you're going where you think you're going. And then lead placement. There's nothing really different um, than during the trial in terms of what the goals are, which is you want to have a nice paramedian shallow approach. You want to advance with control. But you also want to plan for anchoring. You don't want to enter the lower part of your incision space because you're not going to have any place to put the anchor. You really want to enter the upper part of the incision. Um, and if you can't get in, and you can't get in, and you can't get in, then you're going to have to change your incision. So think about that. So test when appropriate, repeat often. The higher up you are, the higher the risk is for badness. So have a low threshold for checking for lateral. Checking for lateral in the operating room is quite different than on the cadaver. We don't care about the sterile environment, so you have to kind of plan for how, you, how you're going to do that. Um, anchoring. Anchoring has really changed compared to when I learned to do this. When I learned to do this, anchoring was a little silicone sheath and tie it as tight as you can without damaging the anchor or breaking the suture. That was literally like the instruction. <laughs> Snap, oh, it was too tight. Uh, that's not tight enough, a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay, is that, do you like it's going to break? Good. It was literally, you want to be tight. Um, now, yes, you want to be tight, but you have a mechanical little feature to make it, make it, makes it work. So there's different anchors. Every company has their own anchor, which is a little bit different, has different characteristics. So make sure you know the anchor you're going to use and are familiar with it. Um, some of them have a snout that kind of goes down along your needle track. You need to open up before you take the needle out and put it in. So I make sure the space is, for the snout is open. I use, if it's a one where I have to suture, I use either O or 2O Tycron, which is a, non, a braided, non-absorbable suture. I, while the needles are in place, I put my sutures in, make sure they're, I tie down, I make sure they're nice and firm and there's no wobbly tissue, and I put a, a, a tag on them, a mosquito usually, set them aside, so I have, I have at least two sutures per anchor in position. Then I take the, the needle on the far side out under live fluoro, um, slide the anchor down, and then, and then loop the suture through. And then depending on which way you anchor, you click it, you click it, you screw it, you do something to make it deploy. Um, then you make sure the final position is good, and then you're done. I check x-ray repeatedly during this process. 
repeatedly during this process. So the patient whose image I'm showing there, can anybody guess what kind of problem she had? So if you look where we are. So she had peripheral neuropathy. So my other part of my life is doing neuropathic pain research stuff. So I see lots of small fiber peripheral neuropathy patients have a clinical trial for, for small fiber peripheral neuropathy. So this is a small fiber peripheral neuropathy patient um, who did really well with kind of this kind of low T, T12 uh, stimulation. There's some variations on that. Um, Boston Scientific has a fixate device which you can deploy. It makes anchoring quicker. Um, Medtronic has the Injex Bumpy Anchor, which hopefully you'll get to play with. I don't know if they have it here to play with, but hopefully they do, so you can, you can then try that. There are other anchors always changing. Anch anchoring is an evolving field. So a few tips for success. Make sure your anchors are in as far as you can get them when you suture them in. Don't have space so that the anchor's here, the lead's here, and then it goes dives in. That is disaster, because that's not anchoring anything. It has to really be so that where the lead is disappearing, your anchor tip is there. Um, you want the anchor not, at an, if this is the patient's back, you don't want your anchor like this. You want your anchor flat. Um, should be nothing loose. When you're done, the anchor should be sitting right there and caref careful. If it's a big, thick patient and you're several centimeters down, you need more access. If, if, you, if you feel like you need more access, you might have a longer incision or you might use the fixate device. If it's a thin patient, you don't want that anchor sitting out underneath their skin. That guy we just saw here, you really are going to have to be off the, uh, if, when you look at that cadaver, he does not have much tissue up higher. So if I'd entered at T11, T12, there'd be, I'd really have to re work to get that deep enough to cover it and make it comfortable for the patient. I don't, the only imaging I save in the operating room is the final imaging, and that's after the anchor is in. And then I, then I save the final imaging. The pocket. There are reports of pain at the pocket side up to 10 or 11% of the time. It's a big deal thing. As anchoring techniques have improved, as, as leads have improved, pocket, relative importance of the pocket discomfort has gone up. As those other things have gone down, this is still an issue. Um, and where the pocket is has changed. When I learned to do this, I put them all here. Which, let me tell you, when you're accessing back here, makes for a more complicated procedure than you can put it back in here somewhere. And then the next place you move to, kind of across the country was here. And then we moved to here. Now some people do a, a single incision. So there's a lot of a way, different ways and different places to anchor, I mean to put the pocket. You should have this discussion with your patient in advance and have a plan. And you should look at them when they're standing up. In the operating room, they're not gonna be standing up. They're gonna be lying down. Tissues go in different directions. Gravity only goes one direction. It's always going this way. That's not the way they spend their life, like this. So think about that. Um, also, you need to have space between, if you're going to do that little common flank location, you have to have space between the ribs and the, and the pelvis. If they have scoliosis, it's going to be an extra challenge. Um, you want the pocket to be snug and tight with enough room to loop the, the redundant lead behind. Um, back to the uh, lead placement, you don't want to use an excessively long lead. It leads to extra lead to to coil behind or to remove, as we discovered last week when we were taking the system out. Um, uh, use, either use the template or the device to make sure you've made the pocket the right size. The depth of the pocket, um, can I come back? Um, the depth of the pocket depends on the manufacturer. In general, for comfort, deeper is better. For programming and recharging, superficial is better. If it was sitting on top of the skin, it'd be really easy to recharge and program. Um, if it was Five centimeters in, it would, they would never feel it. They, they would love that. So somewhere between there is the right answer. Um, and it's probably closer to two centimeters or a centimeter and a half for some companies and as deep as three for others. And you, for most companies, there's one side you have to have facing up. You have that side facing up. Tunneling, put loops uh, uh, at the midline as well as at the pocket. Um, tunnel towards the pocket, stay deep, have your assistant give you a target. I'm gonna go back for a second. You can do a single incision pocket. It is easier with, so the, the, you put the device off the side of the midline incision. It's easier if you have a smaller device. A bigger device is harder. You have less room to do that. It starts being problematic. <coughs> um, so connect. Don't make a mistake here. I, I, I was telling the fellow about uh, 
a, a, an error from the distant past before you could tell when you were tight enough? Or let the fellow tighten? Didn't tighten enough. <laughs> Discovered immediately thereafter, we turned around and went right back in the operating room. It only happened once. And newer devices where it goes click, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I love that. It's very reassuring as opposed to feels right. Um, so some people change their gloves before they, they touch the IPG. I just tend to rinse mine off in the, in the irrigation. Um, assure there's electrical integrity, tighten things up, and you're ready to go. Then close. So in the guidelines, it talks about irrigating, which we'll talk about in a second. So I irrigated. Some people use antibiotics. Some people don't. There's not good evidence about using antibiotic. Um, you can consider using vancomycin powder in the wounds. You can put, the, if you've spent some time doing this, because it's been a difficult case, you can put some more local anesthetic in uh, to um, uh, enhance postoperative pain control. Close tightly, leave no dead space. Dead space is bad. It fills up with something. You don't want it to fill up with something. So leave no dead space by closing tightly. So most commonly, people use interrupted absorbable sutures deep. Um, which is one or two layers depending on the patient's body habitus. Um, and the skin closure should be, the skin is, it's, it's already basically closed, you're just going to hold it together. It shouldn't be that you're putting pressure to bring the skin together. Um, I usually use a running suture, and I have switched to using V-lock suture just for fun, but we'll talk about that later. Other people use staples. There are lots of different ways you can do that. I then put Dermabon on, and I have people put a dressing on for a day or two. But the Dermabon is my real, my real um, cover. Post-op, they need analgesics. Some people use oral antibiotics for up to 24 hours. It's definitely not recommended beyond 24 hours. This is this gray period in which there's not clear recommendations about antibiotics. Um, I ask the patients to have someone look at the incision or incisions every day for the first two months. <laughs> and just to make sure things are going like I want them to go. Um, and if it looks anything like they don't want it to look, call you. I don't care if it's Saturday night at you know, 2 AM. Call if it's a problem, because early intervention can save the device. When it's later, you can't save it. Here's um, some guidelines about reducing the r risk of infection. So um, th there's preoperative practice. There's three pages here, so we're going to go through these real quickly. Um, we already talked about most of these things. Uh, identify remote inf infections, <coughs> optimize glucose control, think about d discontinuing tobacco, decolonize if they have methazone resistant staph aureus, um, use preoperative antibiotics, which are weight based, um, use, make sure the time is within an hour, remove hair, if you're going to remove hair with clippers, not with shaving. Um, uh, Use a scrub. Um, keep, the, keep your own personal nails short. It doesn't mean for the patient. It means for you. Um, do not wear hand or arm jewelry, <laughs> which is not sh shocking of a suggestion. Um, intraoperatively, you know, wear, w use sterile technique is basically what this says. Um, uh, chloroxidine glucon gluconate is the most effective prep, so use that. Um, think about using a drape. Um, uh, Minimize traffic in and out of the room. If you can have a positive pressure room, it's better. Um, don't cauterize the skin. General good idea. Don't cauterize the skin. Um, irrigate with saline. Um, and then uh, be efficient with your time. Longer time increases the risk. And then postoperatively, put an occlusive dressing on for one to two days. Um, don't use topical antibiotic, uh, like bacitrace and ointment or something. Uh, Know that you're responsible for deep infections up to the first year. Um, don't continue antibiotics beyond the first 24 hours. Um, education, the, educate the patient and family about the incision. Wash your hands before and after dressing changes. Using sterile, use sterile technique for dressing changes. And then if you suspect a surgical site infection, be super duper aggressive. OK. So the thing is, there's a whole bunch of steps there. A whole bunch of things to remember. That's why having that checklist is a good idea. Going over it in your head is a good idea. Working with someone is a good idea. I told you how I learned to do it by doing it with surgeons. You know, if you're if if a year from now you're out on your own, you're doing your first implant, it's okay to call your former mentor and, and go through this. I have talked someone through that just very recently. 
OK, tomorrow's your big day. Let's talk about it. Let's go through all these steps. Um, it's, a good, it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to have that little rehearsal. And remember, it's really fun to do this. It's, it's, a, it's a good experience when it goes well. I love doing it with the fellows. It takes longer than it, if I had a PA doing the, to do these with. But you know, it, it's, a, it's a fun experience to do this when it goes well. And it goes well if you plan ahead and know what you're doing. So that is it.